Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Hatzis from Sanctum Psychedelia here with a very good friend of mine, Karen O'Neill. And um, we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, those of you who do podcasts, you know, sometimes you start talking with the guests when it's a friend and, and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, we should just hit the record button. So <laughs> we did that. And um, I had just asked Karen what the name of the retreat center she was working at was. And, and um, I work for myself now. So I specialize in um, Ibogaine for eating disorders down here in Mexico where I don't have to worry about the police so much, you know, maybe a little worried about shakedowns and stuff, but uh, the Ibogaine and other psychedelics are not legal or illegal. They're unscheduled. So it's not like the bullshit up in the States. So sure. for me, Ibogaine worked and you know this because you helped me with my first speech. Boom. <laughs> and what, what, real quick, what Karen is referring to is before her first speech, uh, not to, you seemed a little nervous, so I had her smack me across the face to kind of just get it out of her system. That's what that was. Anyway, and I didn't uh, hesitate at all, did no, I? She did not. <laughs> I think she I'm trying that. to remember if I slapped you a second time because I enjoyed it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just one time, but sorry for interrupting. That's okay. So I, um, I specialize in began for eating disorders, and I took this myself five years ago the first time and three years ago the second time because I was viciously bulimic, binging and purging up to 10 times a day and my clean time was measured in days, not weeks or months. So basically like every two or three hours, you know, and food is very hard to manage. You have to have a healthy relationship with it. So people with eating disorders are in the closet because there's a lot of self-judgment based on judgment of the people around us. Gluttony is very frowned on. Um, purging deliberately is just disgusting. So no one really wants to think about that. But I think it's important to talk about because there's so many people in the closet. And for me, I just, there was no evidence. Five years ago, I was just thinking addiction's addiction. It probably all, you know, goes to the same place. And if there's any chance this will work, I'm doing it. So I did, and it just cut the cravings. It was a very immediate and obvious reset and not a cure and not a magic pill. You still have to do personal work ahead of it and behind it. And for the rest of my life, it's about, for me as a bulimic or anyone with an eating disorder, whether it's binge eating or whatever, to create that healthy relationship with food. And food is everywhere. You can't avoid it. You need it to thrive and survive. And you're always one bite away from too much. And, you know, and everybody that likes food is going to occasionally overeat. I've done it a few times in the last five years, but that's normal. Food tastes good. So we will eat it. So we'll, but then it can be like anything else like drugs or alcohol or gambling or sex or anything that's good and healthy can be uh, a numbing agent. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so the bulimics are just kind of in the closet. And I came to Mexico two and a half years ago when a Ibogaine aftercare place opened and they were looking for volunteers. And I lived in Portland at the time. And I thought, this is great. I always thought I'd maybe go intern at ayahuasca camp sometime and just kind of, you know, have that experience. But my, my purpose for doing this was I wanted to hijack their aftercare, you know, yoga classes and breathwork classes and horseback riding. I mean, like hello, between, you know, cooking, you know, I still had, I was only six months clean at that time. So I really needed to keep it going. Sure, sure. So now I showed up at the place and it was kind of a, you know, not organized because they were new and Alpha Karen steps in, we need this, we need that, we need that. And so I never really was the cook <laughs> because it turned out there already was one. The communication was so bad, nobody bothered to say, yeah, but this is just kind of how things go with a startup. And then you have culture differences too, because a lot of the staff were Mexican. However, most of the clients are American. So there's those differences that need to be communicated and adjusted because an American is coming and paying, you know, a certain amount of money for treatment and for aftercare and all of that. And there are expectations of whatever. So all of these things have been part of my learning process and working with different Ibogaine providers because the aftercare place I worked at for a year and a half, we didn't do treatments there. We would do low dose Iboga, but not Ibogaine. Ibogaine is serious and you need to be near a hospital in case there's an adverse event. So it was a really good training ground. Sure. That place closed and then I went to work for another place for six months, which was Sure. Okay. And ended up, I, I went there to volunteer just as a cook, just to hijack their aftercare and get the cool offerings. Yeah. And then ended up taking more of an administrative role because there were a lot of bridges that had to be, you know, 
gap between two different cultures and treatment and 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 all of these kinds of things sure so you had mentioned um before possibly you thought you might end up at an ayahuasca retreat at some mm -hmm. point have you and i have another follow-up but have you worked with ayahuasca before mm -hmm. you have so i don't lead ceremonies i sure. don't lead ceremonies but i've done it probably 15 times Okay, so then my follow-up would be this, because it seems, uh, and I could totally be wrong, but it's like, it's like the medicine that, for lack of a better way of putting it, saves your life, always seems to be the one that we all, you know, gravitate towards as far as helping others with it. Right. Um, in the sense that, like, I love ayahuasca, but mushrooms saved my life. Right. So those are the ones. That's your that, thing. Yeah, that, that tends to be my thing. So... With um with ibogaine, um I know it's called a a flood when you do it. Is that right. what you, a high a, dose? A high dose is called a flood. Um, I've had a few people try to explain to me what is actually what the experience is like, <laughs> and I know that that's a very 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 that's really funny, yeah, <laughs> and difficult question. But I'm just curious if you had just the the Karen O'Neill description of in your words what is happening in that space. In the Ibogaine space? In the Ibogaine space. Okay, so first I have to stress it's different for everybody. Sure. The medicine does what it wants and what you need. Some people don't even remember. Some people don't have visions. And visions are not the most important, important part. It helps the time go by faster because you're a toxic. You're just like, you know, yeah. <laughs> feeling the medicine, like do its thing and feeling really dizzy and everything. So with visions, you have something to go by. And my first experience was very clear and very specific and precise to me. And because I'm a graphic designer, what I've been most of my adult life, I think in the combination of words and images. So sure. the medicine showed me images combined with text. Here's what you need to do. Here's where you really messed up. And, and, and here's like a little video because like it's your eyes are closed. And generally when your eyes are closed is when the visions come. And it's like you're seeing, seeing little vignettes and they pop up for me uh, for about maybe five seconds or so. And then they fade away and then, then the next one comes in. So mm -hmm. mine were very specific to bulimia. It showed me images of vomit in several different, you know, pretty disgusting ways. But this was the medicine saying, look, this is where your focus has been. And this is what you have to show for it. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't argue with the truth. Yeah, of course. And yeah. it, you've always said that the, the word that always stuck out or the verb you would use is that I began resets you. It does. It it's you. like rebooting a laptop or your phone. It does. It's only temporary. It's like there's a window of 30, 60, 90 days, some people up to six months. So it's not a magic pill. It's not a cure. There are unethical providers that will say that it is. They'll say anything just to get your, you know, $10,000 or whatever they're charging, which is way too much, by the way, for what they're offering. Yeah, 10,000? Yeah. Wow. I so, guess just um, like a, from yeah, my price point, just, you know, in uh, comparison, it's about $5,000, give or take a little bit, because I rent an Airbnb in Rosarito on the beach. So it's just right over the border from San Diego. So mm -hmm. people have anxiety about coming here. It's like, don't believe what you read. It's fine here. Yeah. You know, by and large, it's fine. The vibe is a whole lot How higher. far are you from LA? Uh, I'm four hours and actually I'm going there tomorrow to see my family. All right, next time I'm in LA, which is probably going to be sometime in October. I gotta. I'll be there. I want to take a, a ride down to Rosarito and see the place. Oh, yeah. 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 Let's do it. It'd be great. Yeah, I'll just arrange to visit my family, and you can hitch a ride with me. I love it. I and love then I can toss you on a bus to get back up over the border. You walk across. There's nothing. To it. Sure. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, great. So, I'm looking forward to that. That's yeah, cool. me too. That's going to be great. Yeah, I've got a trampoline in my backyard. We can go jumping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm one of those people that you, you uh, I'm, I'm sure facilitators are, are sick of, but I would, you, until I literally, until I met you, I would use Iboga and Ibogaine interchangeably. No. But the, yeah, see, uh -huh, so. yeah. So. And, and that's very common. That's yeah, very, yeah, very common. Yeah. So specifically, Iboga root bark is the source of Ibogaine. And traditionally in Africa, the Buwini tribe especially, but the pygmies before them, they would dig this root up at maturity or parts of it um, sustainably and, you know, hack it up and dry it out and shred it into powder. 
And then it would be for coming of age ceremonies, generally, like about age 13, kind of like a bar mitzvah or something. Sure, sure. Uh -huh. And it, they would also use it for trauma and PTSD when people were having trouble to help again, you know, help them reset, you know, and again, it doesn't fix anything for you. Uh, you have to do that yourself, mm -hmm. but it takes it away. Actually, that's not true. My PTSD went away and has not come back, but I've been careful about what situations I put myself in, you know, because mine was sexual trauma when I was young. So as a single person, I'm just really careful where I go, who I visit, you know, and so, you know, I've been just careful with that. Sure. And do you know much about how Ibogaine made its way from the African continent to Central America? Like, do you yeah. know much of that? Because I don't know anything about it. It didn't really go to Central America. It went to the United States, is my oh, understanding. Really? Oh, so again, the root bark is Iboga, mm -hmm. and Ibogaine is an extraction. So okay. the extraction is like reduced down. A typical dose is like anywhere from a gram to a gram and a half, depending on the person, if they're detoxing from something, what they're, blah, 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 all of these height, weight, individual characteristics, their health. And, but then you're just taking basically six to eight pills in intervals of 10 or 20 minutes. And um, that's, that's what I begin is. Sure. And how did it so, get over to this part of the world? Pardon? How did it get I'm not really sure, but Howard Lotsoff was a 19 year old drug addict. He was a university student on the East coast. And he was looking for something. He, I guess he couldn't find his heroin or whatever it was he was looking for. So he went to a friend's house who was a chemist and just looking for anything to trip balls, right? Yeah, and anything, you know, just take me out or take me out of here. Yeah. So the chemist was like, here, try this. And he did. And like the next morning, he thought that was really strange. And, and I've not really heard a description of what it was that he experienced, but that tells me there were a lot of visions that were unique to him and unlike anything he'd ever done before, because it's not psychedelic in the way that ayahuasca is with the geometry and the patterns. I mean, it can be, but that's not the primary thing. And again, I'm only speaking to my experience because in ayahuasca, I don't have visions. You know, really? I have, I just have the, the kaleidoscope and the feelings and the downloads Really? I've never oh, had, and I've gone deep. Oh, I've yeah. Deep. I um, only do high doses with ayahuasca. I, I'm a bit of a chicken now. After my second, <laughs> after my second Ibogaine flood, it was uh, pretty rough. It was also what I needed to finally make that change because, you know, I did the one, did well for a bit, bottomed out, got worse than I ever was. And by the time I was ready for the second one, I was ready to do whatever it took. And the second one was so awful for me. It's like, I do not ever want to have to do this again. You know, <laughs> that was my resolution. And that was probably the firmest intention I've ever set in my life. Really? So again, this was all part of like medicine gave me an awful experience compared to my amazing first one that I was just fascinated with. You know, I was seeing, you know, my brain and body and soul all talk to each other like they do. Yours is, mine is. But we're not aware of it because, you know, we've got filters in our brain to protect us from, you know. From mind at large, as uh, yeah. I actually called it. Yeah. Well, we all have all knowledge. That's my belief. We all have all knowledge. We all have connection to source, to each other. And you can bring uh, religion into it or not. That kind of is, doesn't really matter to me. But I'm like, the, the bigger picture is like, we all have, we all know all things. And this is like a very intelligent design we got going on here. Sure. So what, and uh, you, you mentioned the word source and we, we all sometimes, you know, sometimes people use that. What, it, what would be your, for lack of a better word, definition, because how do you define it? But what is source to you? Oh boy. You have to ask me the hard <laughs> questions. We ask the tough questions at Sanctum Psychedelia. <laughs> Honestly, one word, connection. Connection. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 And that's what all of these medicines that I've worked with in the time I've come to Mexico have really taught me, you know, from the 5-MeO, what we call Bufo down mm -hmm. here, to ayahuasca, psilocybin, which I remember taking as a teenager and thinking, well, this is just like a party thing. You know, how could this possibly be a spiritual experience? You know, this is the, the ignorance that we have, even if we've experienced these things, if we haven't done it properly without the right, you know, intentions and set and setting and, and, and integration afterward and preparation beforehand and, and all of that. Yeah, my first mushroom trip was uh, 18. And for me, it was actually really spiritual. Like I never really... Um, how can I put it? Like, 
it was for me anyway it was kind of like from the beginning that's what i saw it as being like even before i ate them so i kind of had that paradigm and perhaps that helps um but with uh with ibogaine so you've done ayahuasca 15 times you know how many times you've done ibogaine twice oh, oh it was just the two times yeah because oh wow th this is this is a treatment so the reason it costs a lot of money is because it can be dangerous you, you need medical testing Make sure your heart and liver are strong. The liver converts the ibogaine into noribogaine, which stays in the system for a while, which is why those organs have to be, you know, in, in good working condition. You need an EKG to make sure your heart is okay. Uh, drug tests, people even that come for a spiritual experience are hiding things. You know, they don't want to admit that they have a problem or that maybe they recreationally used or they, that they did recently. They're coming into a medical setting where they're going to be searched, you know, and then we're going to do the testing to make sure, but it, it's pretty serious stuff. So it's the yeah. most hardcore psychoactive compound that we know of Yeah, because of the resetting. It, it takes down your blood pressure, your heart rate slows down, uh, you're a toxic, the, the brainstem distributes the medicine throughout the body and you your depth the depth perception is gone and um yeah you need help walking to the bathroom things like that yeah, so sure. this is not something you do for fun no yeah i mean it's like for me it's the same thing with like i or mushrooms or 5-meo dmt it's like i mean it is fun but that's not like it's not party time fun it's like right. soul searching fun right you know, it's discovery fun exactly um, and that seems to but be after I began, you really do need about 30 days off of your life because you are reset and you're also emotionally fragile. Now I, I realize you can be emotionally fragile after these other medicines you talked about, but not for a month, you know, maybe, maybe for a day or two or a week or so, depending on what it brought up, you know, maybe unresolved trauma or whatever, you, not minimizing those experiences. But this is like, you think you're feel great. Everything's unicorn and rainbows. And then someone gives you a funny look or speaks with too sharp of a voice, which is what I've had to learn, you know, to really know when to modulate and tone it down and, and create the very soft, loving, supportive environment. So, you know, it, they're basically a fragile newborn, you know, so, so I treat them like a newborn that can speak and that has memories and that has a desire and a purpose to their life to be different depending on the reason that they were doing this medicine in the first place. Sure, and it does. So it also helps with finding purpose, then, or is like, or is it like well, the purpose much is free from the purpose would be I don't want to drink alcohol anymore. Sure. I don't want to use meth anymore, or heroin, or opiate pills. Uh, in my case, I don't want to binge anymore, and I don't want to purge. Following that, sure, sure, wow. So no, the... you don't just say, "Well, I want to do these things." You have to have a plan, and this is part of. I'm I'm a certified uh, being true to you coach. So I've gone through some being true to you. Oh, what, what is that? So it's a, it's a really rigorous program and it's really good, jam packed with all kinds of great information. And it's coaching, transformational coaching for recovery. And the recovery could be anything from a simple detox, like eating better or vowing to exercise more and then just having, working with someone to help keep them on track to all the way to, you know, very intense addiction of some kind and having a plan. So a coach will help the person set their own plan you know, based on their likes, preferences, what they've tried before, what they would like to try, uh, their interests, their hobbies. Uh, and it's all about bringing you back into a heart-centered space within yourself. Because when you have that, then you, the addiction has really less to cling to. Sure. You know, because like all of a sudden you're, you're, you're operating, you're vibrating from a much higher frequency. And so, and that applies to people, you know, I don't attract that many toxic people anymore and when i see them it's like yeah it's from a distance you know and unless they're a client which is a totally different thing totally yeah. different thing because i'm there to help them navigate their way but yeah for people in my personal life even family members it's like you know i have solid boundaries and yeah you you, you can't stick to me sorry <laughs> you know yeah boundary is such a it's so weird because people never spoke about that stuff like people never like at least for me growing up they never spoke about self-care or boundaries or any of that like this is all about pretty... be nice be nice yeah you know don't put yourself first and actually self-care is the opposite of selfishness you know it's only when you're coming from like a, a fuller vessel do you have anything worthwhile to 
offer anybody. If you're coming from a place of, and let's not talk about the harder addictions, but let's just say codependency or, or jealousy or those things, you're, you're operating from that place and you can be really, really stuck there and have no idea and you keep seeking out the same kinds of situations, whether it's a work relationship, professional relationship, um, an intimate relationship, a partner, a marriage, you know. Sure. And when, when, when you bring it back to that place of self-care, well, what is it that I need to be happy? Not at the cost of someone else, but what is it that I need to be happy? Well, I need to have some daily rituals. I need to do some kind of body movement in the morning, maybe some yoga, maybe go for a walk, bike ride, uh, have a little time set aside for some meditation, uh, take breaks throughout the day, you know, connect with people that make you feel good and seek out your tribe. Yeah. And do you find, because I, I've felt that like the more like ensconced I am in my own entheogenic practices, the more like I find that I am attracting, you know, the right kind of people into my life. Um, so I don't know. It's it just what you said just kind of reminded me of that. There's that. Yeah, it resonates. That's what makes it like, I mean, for like magic. That's what makes it magic. Is and this that, is, you know, back to your question, what is source? Source is connection. And connection is what you put out is what comes back to you. And it sounds like all a lot of attraction-y and new agey woo-woo stuff. Yeah. But, but I think it's just a basic fundamental. And I've really only discovered that in the last couple of years of my life. You know, a lot of my experiences in Mexico, working with different medicines, meeting different shamans that were trained, you know, in a wide variety of situations, whether uh, with a tribe or, or in a school or, or whatever, just I've met so many different amazing people that all of these things, and I'm a natural skeptic. I mean, I was born pretty much atheist and, but my parents were agnostic. So that just means you're supposed to be open, right? I would think so. <laughs> yeah, but it turns out that's a really limited belief, at least for me, because being agnostic, it's like, okay, I uh, have my life. I live it to the best of my ability, do good in the world, be happy, blah, 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 uh, do no harm, right? And then death is the price that I pay for that. So I like the idea that it's finite. I love the idea that, okay, in 20 more years or however much longer I have left, like gone, you know, gone. But in working with these medicines is just the sense that uh, -uh <laughs> we are all eternal. We are all eternal and energy doesn't die. It shifts somewhere else. And there's so much we don't know. I mean, there could be multiple universes. You and I are probably talking in infinite multiple universes right now pretty much the same conversation but maybe uh you don't have that mushroom over there you know behind you you know uh, or uh, maybe uh, i'm uh, not in puerto so nuevo but i'm in you know at my house yeah. you know in ensenada so you know it's like it's so we know the universe is infinite and that means we cannot begin to put a box around it so it just kind of opened me up to all of that yeah but and I i'm not all woo wee I i've become uh, that since you and I met each other originally yeah. three years ago, but uh, it's just been a process. Yeah, it's weird because it's like, you, you've met like space is infinite, but at the same time, space as we know it is also expanding. Yeah. What the hell is it expanding into if it's infinite? I know, I know. <laughs> you know like, <laughs> Our little pea brains just cannot. I know. Even when I, I was a little kid, my yeah. parents would talk about infinity in the universe, it's like, it was too much for me. It's like, yeah, I don't even want to think about it, you know, because I like to put a box around things. I like to have a container, even though I'm like this, maybe because I'm this wild spirit kind of a person, I need to rein myself in sure. sometimes. And so I seem to have been born that way to a certain extent. Yeah, it's weird because with 5-MeO-DMT, that was like the only time that I actually could conceive of infin of all of space and all of time in one shot. Yeah. Like, I, like I, look, I was like, holy shit. That's it. Like, there it is. That's literally everything. And now it's like, it's odd. I have this memory of seeing it, but my brain in this space can't recreate it. No way. It's an odd, yeah. yeah, I no. know. Like, no. it, like, it really is mind expansion. Like, in that once it deflates, it's like you can't even hold or comprehend the things that you had seen or experience while you were there. I don't know. One thing all these medicines have in common is that they turbocharge you. They they elevate you, boom, really fast with 
five MEO, I was like, yeah, you're out of there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, all of the medicines do it in a different way where you're, you're, you're stripped of some of your filters. You're, you're more open to the possibilities. Um, you're looking at yourself with more love, although ayahuasca is an exception. The first couple of hours can be rough as you're releasing. But as you come out the other side, it's, it's you know, you're feeling the love, you're feeling the harmony and connection. And in all of these medicines, they just, they show you what's possible to create within yourself. Mm -hmm. So they're wonderful. You yeah. know, when I was a little girl, you know, nobody asked me, you know, if, if someone would ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's like, it, yeah, work with sacred psychedelic medicines. It's like, yeah, that just <laughs> is probably becoming an option now for today's children that are being born now or maybe 10 years old because we have this huge um, consciousness shifting going on here worldwide, yeah. universally, I'm sure. Yeah. We're, I hope, we're getting back to the basics. Yeah, I hope so because like this, these younger kids, they also like, they got gypped like big, big time. time. They got so, they got so railroaded with like, essentially the internet is like ruined these kids. I mean, it yeah. just, you know, I mean, it's pretty much ruining humanity. Um, yeah. It, you know, we, I, I know I'm, I'm in a minority on this, but I don't think the human species is ready for the internet. Like we, we didn't even figure out responsible gun use yet. And I think yeah. the internet is far yeah. more dangerous than a gun. Like far oh. more dangerous. Like a yeah. gun, yeah, that could kill a few people. In internet, the internet, especially social media, has the ability to collapse civilizations. It can do it if people aren't careful. So I feel I would, bad for this kid, and there's going to be a battle. I think we're not, you know, a a psychic war, a spiritual war, with these plant medicines and people that want that natural human experience versus these bullshit corporations that are just trying to sell you ads on Facebook, you know. And it's going to be up to the this this next generation of kids to either, you know, throw off the essentially the mental slavery that is the internet world in favor of real deep truth and connection. So, I'm sorry. And that's my- No, 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 I agree. I agree. I think the difference is, um, well, I'll speak to the difference in a minute. First, I had this thought just pop in that uh, I believe there's a theory out there and I believe that the medicine has been evolving or following us as we are making our way through the world, you know, throughout, you know, the millennia. So uh, these medicines bring us back to ourselves, right? So that's the one part of it. But as far as the children go, yes, they were born at a, at a time where all of this, I mean, like the industrial revolution part two, right? Yeah. The or the technology part. revolution. I don't even know if they call it that. The digital but, revolution. Yes. It's What's happened is we've, we've gotten away from the practices. We don't have to go out and grow our food anymore. We don't have to go out and hunt our animals or, you know, or build our homes, or we don't have all this physical labor. And without doing what your body is supposed to do, we fall into the lazy stuff. Like, and for me, it's Netflix, you know, it's yeah, like, that's oh, yeah, how I too. chill out at night. Yeah. yeah, me too. It's just like, it's, it's like, oh, here's my phone. And you know, oh, wow, there, there's two hours gone. You know, I don't get back. Uh, yeah. So. And what's interesting is like, some people won't even see that as a distraction. Like, like I'll talk to someone and they'll bring up like, oh, that mushroom use. Oh, you're just trying to escape. It's like, no, 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 no. When I eat mushrooms, I'm connect. I'm trying to understand. When I'm trying to escape, I'm binge, binge watching. You know, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. That's you know on, on Hulu. That's what I want to just kind of have everything you know be destroyed. But I have to. I find that like I have to be like I have to regulate myself with that and be really careful because it's real easy to just fall into a hole of just watching an entire season of a show in you know a day or a weekend or something. You know, and it's yeah. like. Um, especially now with the isolation that we have yeah that's the other mm -hmm. thing and so many people are you know like there's i've heard a lot about people committing suicide just because of the loneliness mm -hmm. and it's like that breaks my heart and it's like if we just had things like mushrooms available to people i don't know i feel like we but could it will help them realize because you have two camps the, the people that are living in fear and the people that see this as an opportunity. It's like a challenging opportunity, but you get the opportunity to go back into yourself, go back into yourself, figure out what's working and what's not working. I was really sick at the end of March and I was in bed for a couple of weeks and I was grateful 
for this illness because it slowed me down from my usual go, 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 you know, lifestyle and work style to realize that it was really time for me to break away and start doing the work that I'm doing now, which, you know, turns out it's a calling, you know, let the world know that Ibogaine works for eating disorders and let them know they can talk to me and let them know they can call me and let them know that I have options for them that they may not know they have. Yeah, they are callings. I'm, I'm glad, I'm, I'm really happy to use that word because people will ask me sometimes about ayahuasca and I'll be like, you know, for years, I had no desire to even try ayahuasca. It's like, look, I got my mushrooms. I love my mother. That's all I need. But then she called out to me like Aya did. Like she was like, mm-hmm. no, like I, and all of a sudden I was like, okay, I need to do this now. Like I went from like literally like 24 hours of, I have no desire until she, she calls out and is like, okay. And I'm just curious, does, did I begin to do the same thing or did you seek it more because you knew what could help? With After, what you know? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. After my first experience, my first blood dose, I was so fascinated by this amazing medicine and my very clear experience of what it was. Like I said, I had visuals going on. I could see like this little icon uh, of a brain up in, you know, one part of my head, just showing all the activity in the brain as the mo- molecule went throughout all of it. And again, being a visual person, the medicine is showing me what my body and soul are and brain are experiencing. I became very curious about different psychedelics after that. And so I tried ayahuasca. I tried uh, 6-APB, which is actually an unscheduled chemical cousin of MDMA. What is it called? 6-APB. It's a research chemical. 6-APB. How was that? that? Uh, Amazing. Because I I did MDMA once, but I was like, hey, let's go paint everybody's house on the block. You know, that frenetic, you know, amphetamine type energy. Mm -hmm. And with the 6-APB, you're a couch potato. So I got on the phone with my coach at the time, and she's like a medium clairvoyant type. She can just like plug, you know, right in. She's like, whoa, it's like you're on mescaline or something. And, And we were able to basically do therapy you know, and, and resolve some of the things in my life that needed to change in a much easier and quicker way. And they're doing studies about this now, you know, ketamine assisted and, you know, all of these things that we're reading about. And it's so amazing that funding is happening and that it's going through Ivy League universities. So it's verified, but we're, we're all still kind of stuck in the Nixon era of these things are really bad and they're drugs. And there's such a difference between high vibration medium vibration, low vibration. You know, yeah, but you don't think we're getting a little out of that? Like, I, I, I feel you on that, like with the whole, we're kind of like, we're still in that Nixonian kind of thing, but I feel like things are getting a little bit better. I mean, we're oh, about a whole lot better. for mushroom, you know, uh, therapy up here in Oregon in, in November. Yeah, uh, there's I know, it's amazing. Cannabis, I mean, like my window right here, I could throw a rock and hit two different cannabis stores. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, so... Yeah. It's good that because the I, people are demanding it. We're demanding people it. We're demanding it. But I, there's also like we're in a very different part of the country than let's say somebody living in uh, you know not to shit on Alabama, but let's say somebody living in Alabama, they don't have they, one. There isn't all that much access, you know, to okay. these things. Um, and <laughs> excuse me, two. Even if you did find access to them, the laws are so draconian that it's almost not even worth it. Because if you get caught, it's like you're not getting a slap on the wrist. You're not going to rehab. You're not going to jail for a year. You're going to fucking prison for a right. while. Right. And it's like, and, and we wonder why society like is like, there's such a sickness in it. And it's like, well, look what, like you're taking these medicines that people have been using forever mm-hmm. <laughs> and they work and you're saying people can't use them. And then you're taking somebody like, you know, an unfortunate, let's say a heroin addict, and instead of giving that person Ibogaine or ayahuasca, you throw them in fucking prison. Like, how is that helping? <laughs> no. Yeah, it, it's a ripple effect. But like you pointed out, things are getting better. It's just gonna, it's going to take a while. And my experience with psychedelic medicines has been in Portland, which is like, you know, like a great place, so I'm uh, <laughs> you know, for culture and, and finding like-minded people. And then doing the work that I do here the last couple of years, more than a couple of years in Mexico. So I can't really speak to what it would be like in, you know, Kentucky or, you know, or North Dakota. Uh, You don't want to know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, but, you know, I I do have um, 
an internet presence, you know, and so as you do, so we, we speak to people all the time in isolated places that are like, hey, I'm interested in this. So, I mean, seeds are being planted. You know, yeah. hearing about it. And this is the good part of social media. Yes. Without social media, I would not be doing, I wouldn't be here. I would have had my Ibogaine experience, the, the two of them, and stayed in Portland and figured out something to do with my life. I have no idea what that outcome or option would have looked like for me. But, but the internet was actually what brought me down here in the first place. So I've had like all these internet friends that I eventually meet in person, a lot of them that are just some of the best people, you know, that, that I know. So it, it, it's, it's, it's like use with caution, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> read the warning label, yeah. you know, don't just hand it over to your kids and expect it to be their babysitter. Yeah. You know? like How about I, do some parenting, you know, get them, get them out, throw a baseball with them. Every yeah. Day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I, so I, I know, like I said before, I, I certainly have my criticism of the internet, but I also do appreciate what it's done i mean it's yeah. it's this weird thing where it, it feels like it was helping society and then it just started to go all downhill and well, it's i guess it's not so much let me if I, it's not so much the internet that's a problem it's this that's the problem yes yeah. this is the problem not the internet this mm. because you can Absolutely. take this i can't take my desktop with me anywhere so one of the things i've been doing like i'll leave like if i go to out whatever i just leave my phone at home yeah, okay i don't there's nothing on there for me i'm riding my bike right now i'm smoking a joint i want to ride my bike and i don't want to be bothered you know so yeah. uh, you know it's no, it, it's, it's about use with caution use with care yeah i, I just responsibly or whatever oh sorry what was that or carefully no i was just elaborating on yeah yeah but it's the problem is that again like this newer generation is being raised in a world we're being completely sucked up by this is normal because right. all their friends are being sucked up by this. Oh, I swear the children are shot out of their mother, you know, with their texting thumb yeah. working. <laughs> yeah, right. I say that as a joke and it's an exaggeration, but most people can understand. Yeah, yeah. Because they can relate, especially if they are over the age of, say, 30. Yeah, and there's also, I mean, people like, especially like, I I've seen like pictures like on Facebook, it's like, the kid was just born five seconds ago. And we don't need a picture. picture of it. Here's the like, picture on Instagram. Like how, like, did you ask the kid? Do you want, well, you can't. I don't know, this whole thing of like, essentially forcing children into becoming fodder, advertisement and corporate fodder of the internet starting that early in their lives, I just think is really dangerous. But It's the programming. Well, think about what children are like, they're sponges. Exactly. Right? They That's can learn so fast and so much, whereas like you and I, you know, say we want to learn another language, we have to work a whole lot harder than that three-year-old does. They just pick it up like that. Yeah. And so then with Ibogaine too, and I'm kind of taking it back to the Ibogaine and remember how I said it's a, it's like you're a newborn. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what was my point? Oh, I'm so <laughs> you know, it just like, you have to be really careful what you do, especially in the first 30 days. Now, when I did this the first time, I didn't know any better. There wasn't much information out there. And I was just in bed because I was too weak because it was hard on the body. I was 55 years old at the time. And so, and I'm a lightweight, little goes a long way. So it was a few days before I was walking around. It's like, well, I should have got a stack of books to read. But instead, that's where my Netflix addiction that I have now started. Really? Yeah, it was like, well, I need to do something. You know, sure. you're not sleeping much for the first 30 days and especially not the first week. If you get, you know, four hours sleep a night, the first week, you're doing real good. Really? Doing, yeah, because so you're, you're just awake. Days? You're just awake. Huh. The experience just itself, you're awake for about 36 hours. And some people are able to sleep. It just depends on the person. But I was, I was awake for about four or five days. Really? And then there's a reduced need for sleep for about 30 days after that. Really, and it, so it's it, like be careful what you do, what you put into yourself as a newborn, whether it's from Ibogaine or because you're just this brand new little baby that came into the world. Be careful what you put into it because that's what's going to stick, and sure. that's what you will become. Is there a bit of a so? Luckily, I didn't start watching porn. You know, <laughs> is is there a bit of a risk though? Um, with um, oh, I just lost my question. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It'll come back at some point, I'm sure. Um, oh, where was it? I'm so sorry. A risk, oh, the risk, risk of, of this. If you're up for a few days at a time, 
isn't there a risk of actually going insane? Like for being up for more than two or three days? No, because you feel pretty wonderful. You feel oh, okay. pretty wonderful. You're emotionally fragile, but again, you're surrounding yourself with your, you're choosing to be in an environment that's loving and soft and supportive. Sure, sure. So it's not the same as if you or me right now without any medicine in us, like I'm going on two hours sleep because it was just noisy last night in the, in the hood, you know, and I live in a rural area, but yeah, the, yeah, tuba players. Okay. Tuba players. There's like workers just a few doors down from me. And I'm, again, it's not like a block or a neighborhood or anything, but they're gathering sage and they're playing this polka tuba music starting at 645. Polka music at 645. It's a bad idea at any time, right? But yeah. <laughs> yes. And I'm the only gringa. <laughs> Indeed. I'm the only gringa around for about five kilometers any direction. I ain't saying a thing, you know. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just can't imagine being woken up that early by, of all things, polka music. Like well, that let just... me tell you about my night last night. So uh, at the place I used to work, it's south of Ensenada. There is a peninsula, and it's like right on the ocean. So you have uh, this peninsula, and I, I lived and worked there at Serenity Beach, I began for six months in the last year, and they have a sweat lodge ceremony, the Temescal, every Sunday. So I go every Sunday that I possibly can. And the, oh, and just as a side note, on the back side of that peninsula is the estuary, and I live on the estuary. But uh, that's just like for your information. Oh, you. So I got dosed a little bit yesterday. Yeah, what happened? Um, well, the, the sweat lodge potentiates it. First of all, I'm a lightweight. Yeah. So, yeah. But the sweat lodge, so you've got like a dark environment, you've got the heat, all these things really, really potentiate. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And these are some of the things, sometimes we might microdose, microdose psilocybin or even ayahuasca. I, I've had these experiences just in, you know, in my work as a staff member of this place or of that place. And yeah, it, it was really amazing. So when I was finally able to, you know, limp the road, you know, 10 kilometers back home, I was still just wide awake. So I was awake until about 4 a.m., and no, the light was coming up, so it was about six. So I'm just dozing off and on comes the polka music. So I'm a little ragged. So this speaks to your question. Normally you go without sleep and yeah, you're, you're gonna feel it. But when you are under this high vibration medicine, it's a whole different thing. So it's not dangerous. You don't need to worry about it. Now, if it goes on for weeks and weeks, it might be time. And, and if the client is complaining, it might be time to look at melatonin or something like that. Sure. But it's kind of best to let the body just fall, figure out what's the new normal and not mess up the cycle. Let it, let it find itself just like a baby learns how to sleep through the night. Sure. Has that Eventually. somebody been awake for like two weeks after I began like that you know about? Uh, well, I've worked with a lot of uh, clients. Yeah. Um, that, not I mean, two that's straight probably... weeks, but just, you know, they'll lay down in bed. They try. We, we, the places I've worked at least for the first two weeks, they're there. They're not allowed to have phones because we want to be careful what, you know, um, what relationships they're, you know, engaging in, because if they're involved in a toxic relationship, oh boy, things are going to get, you know, worse. So, you know, this is their time for them. So they don't have devices or even the ability to listen to music unless they have an iPod, which has no internet access. Or a record player. So, yeah. So, you know, I hear everybody's trying to sleep and they're just like laying in bed, you know, maybe wandering around, you know, outside on the grounds or, or whatever, just trying to get tired. And after a couple and maybe they'll sleep an hour or two here or there, but you know, that, that won't run them ragged. Huh. It's very subjective. It's, it, it's happened. I wouldn't say it's super common to go that long. Sure. Yeah, no, I, that's something. That and then I, we try to run them ragged during the day too. It's like, Hey, we've got, you know, we've got, you know, coaching exercises, journaling exercises for you to do the, you know, the work that I do. We uh, let's go up for a zip line tour, you know, zip lines and, you know, suspension bridges is like, you know, 30 minutes away from where I live. It's really cheap. Let's go do that. Let's go ride some horseback. The pool's open. Let's go there and swim a few laps. So, you know, make them tired. Oh, my God. can I come over? The zip line, <laughs> horses, what? Well, I think you invited yourself. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. yeah, you invited yourself. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, it's pretty cool. That's amazing. No, that's good. And so the, the integration then is just part of the entire experience. Like yeah. you don't have anybody come to Ibogaine, have a flood and then like, all right, have a great, you know, <laughs> good luck with that. You, you no, actually that's usually how it's done. 
Yeah. That's usually how it's done. Ibogaine clinics, it's, it's the grist meal, you know, kind of like a goose, in, out, in, out. And there are places that will do it in as little as three days, which I think is criminal, but they do it at a low enough price that someone with that is just desperate to change, it works for about 30% of the people that do it that way. If you have pre-care and after-care, where you're really stopping to think about how to plan to do it, you know, and this is the work that I do, that I have the most experience in, and now I'm getting a little more specific, you know, what that looks like for the people with eating disorders, because everybody's different and it has to be tailored to them. Yeah. But you want to really just, um, uh, I lost it again. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah, you just want to keep them busy and keep them occupied and have that pre-care setting intentions and, and the follow-up. It's a much, you get, the medicine is the easy part. And people would, you know, a lot of people are afraid of it, but that's actually the easy part. You still have to do the personal work. And that means up front and behind. And that was the point that I forgot. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's another one of those words where we were talking about self-care and boundaries. Another word that's pretty new to psychedelia, except in the 1950s, but it kind of resurfaced, is integration. Right. Like when I first ate mushrooms at 18 and LSD and all, I never heard Things that, like nobody talked about integration. When did I hear of it? I think I started hearing it after my first Ibogaine flood. And it was really more of the need for aftercare because there yeah. wasn't enough of that available. You know, facilities that did just that. You know, sure. and if that aftercare is like outside of the United States, depending on the country, they might be able to offer other medicines. If it's in the United States and you're uh, doing it, paying taxes and, you know, and on the internet, it's a totally different thing. You can't offer those things. It's just more about, um, Finding a routine and a regimen that works for you, you know, getting up in the morning, making your bed first thing. And if you do nothing else, you did that. These things are really important as for someone that's been run, their whole lives have been run by an addiction for however many years that that has been. Yeah, so it, it's really important to cement the new habits right away. Sure. Yeah. And do you find that those new habits after like, do they like, what would be the percentage of people that, it has that lasting, like that you instill the habits 30 days. Sure. How is the it? People is there, that do that, the medicine with the pre-care and aftercare have about a 50%. 50%? Mm -hmm. okay. And that about 30% can just come and just do the medicine and something in them, you know, they're, they're able to do it. And then you contrast that with like AA, which is like 5%, you know, so say someone goes into their first meeting today you know, in a year from today, 5% will have remained sober for that time. And then you have detox and rehab, which again is more of a lockdown situation, but people in there are basically planning on what they're going to do when they leave, you know, because of, you know, there's not that assistance of, of the medicines. Yeah, there was in the, the 19, I actually just finished a book. It comes out next May um, on the, the, the uh, psychedelic revolution of the 1950s. And, um, they actually talk about a lot of this stuff that we're just rediscovering today. Yeah. Like because it's been buried. Yeah, it has been. It's been buried and it's it's starting to come back. And um, that's one of the reasons Eden and I are building the uh, the psychedelic library because I mean I have all these old papers from you know of the fifties before that. I mean even in the eighteen hundreds, like the first people you know uh, uh, essentially Westerners trying peyote for the first time and and writing about it in medical journals. Mm -hmm. So we just, we want to spread that information so that, you know, um, these things don't get buried again. And that the, uh, the idea of integration does stay and it becomes a permanent fixture with mm -hmm. LSD as much as the Beatles. Um, mm -hmm. But it's weird that you said that with uh, AA, it's only 5%. Back in the 50s, when they were using LSD to treat alcoholism, the the results were phenomenal. They were like in the high 90% of people not and anymore. For that 5%, that's a lot of people. That's millions of people. So I'm not knocking it. Whatever oh, recovery tool, whatever works for you. And the fellowship is great and the program is great. It's just oh. some people need more help. Yeah, I'm just saying LSD works yeah. better. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no <laughs> argument there. Yeah, that's no all. argument there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're surprisingly almost at an hour. Um, it's been fun, hasn't it? Yeah, like that yeah. flew. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I feel like we've been talking like five minutes. Um, how do people get in touch with you if they're interested in your work, your ideas? Um, we have 
on, I believe, on the Sanctum YouTube page, we, we have your speech from the guy in mind. So. And, you know, I still get inquiries from that. Really? Yeah. The I, people, you know, there, I wasn't doing the music. I was six months clean, right? It's like, oh, I got to share this with the world. And they'll say, like, hey, I guess you'd be a good person to talk to about this. It's like, not only am I a good person to talk to about it, but I'm the only person in the world that does this specifically for eating disorder and ibogaine. I'm not so, all, you know, there it, needs to be, you know, there needs to be like a consciousness, you know, a raised awareness that, and that's kind of what I've been doing since I met you. Just like people need to know, people need yeah. to know. I mean, I'm not really selling anything. I'm giving the information and it's something to think about. And if it speaks to you or calls to you, your favorite word here, uh, then let's, uh, yeah, let, let's talk. So how do people get to uh, so, Yeah. A uh, best way to find me is on Facebook. Sure. So Karen O'Neill, O-N-E-E-L. Yeah. And, or Google my name and, and go to the videos. Um, I'll, I'll send you the personal information, you know, phone numbers and all that. Sure. Sure. And uh, when we post this, we'll put the, you know, the links and everything will be in the description. Terrific. Box so that Terrific. Everybody... Thank you. Well, yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, you've been like, you, you, you caught that ball and you've been running with it, you know, yeah. really doing I, I elected myself. You, know? yeah. well, <laughs> you would have had my vote. I'm a tyrant. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so finding you on Facebook again, that's Karen O'Neill, Karen with a K, O'Neill with an N, not a K, O-N-E-E-L. I'll right. call you out there interested in talking to Karen, who is so knowledgeable of this stuff mm -hmm. with, with Ibogaine. And if I may say also just an incredibly wonderful person. Oh, you know, I don't, I don't know everybody personally that we interview, but I do know mm -hmm. Karen and she's amazing. Right. If you are looking for somebody out there and you really want true help with somebody who really cares karen o'neill awesome thank you thank you uh, all right i guess else? i'll see you in october my sure. friend. do you have anything else you'd like to say sign off with or just that plants are the way but that's a little <laughs> restrictive because you know there are animal you know there there's combo you know from a frog and there's you know the five meo so you know nature is the way maybe is a better way to adapt that saying Truth. Well, I want to thank yeah. you so much, Karen. Uh, for, it's been uh, an honor and a privilege. Us. Thank you. Yeah, I cannot wait to come hang out with you in your little yeah. beach house and ride horses. <laughs> okay, well, hey, it's rustic. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's way rustic. That's fine with me. <laughs> like, that sounds great. Like, yeah. are there going to be people beeping their car horns every 10 seconds? Are gonna be oh, well, no, actually, there will be because it's on a busy road. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we just get go down the hill a little bit, you know, and get closer to the estuary. And it, I've learned to turn, tune it out. Yeah, on our horses, we'll go down. Yeah. I will be sitting there and, like, hear the clop, clop, clop. In fact, last night during my insomnia, about 3 a.m., I hear a horse going down the road, someone's riding a horse down the road. I mean, it's just a delightful, you yeah. know, a delightful, uh, different experience that you would not have in most of the United States in these times. Yeah, I, mean, I grew up in New York, not too many. I mean, well, I guess you have the Central Park, so oh, damn, that doesn't work. St. Louis, I also lived in St. Louis and there were no horses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, again, thank you so much, Karen. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, can't wait to speak again. Can't wait to check out what you have going on down there. Right. And um, uh, for everybody out there for listening, uh, thank you so much. I'm Tom Hatzis from Sanctum Psychedelia. And as Karen said, plants are the way. <laughs> Adios. Love Adios. to both of you. Till next time, all. Okay. Peace. Uh, how do I? Oh, there it is. <laughs>